Uh, we have a speaker who I think is uh, known to us all for lots of great reasons. Dr. Andrew Wright um, attended uh, the University of Louisville for medicine, then went to Wisconsin for residency. And we were very fortunate to have him join us here at the University of Washington and to entice him to stay afterwards. Um, he's an endowed professor and the director of the C Center for Video Endoscopic Surgery at the University of Washington, the director of our advanced uh, GI and MIS bariatric fellowship, the UW Department of Surgery uh, and director of technical skills for our education, the director of the hernia center and the former clinical director of surgical specialties at WISH. So I think as you can tell, he's done lots of work um, locally and extensively in surgical education and surgical skills. He's championed uh, the advancement of minimally, minimally invasive surgical techniques and has been an early adopter and advocate of the use and value of social media in medicine and surgery. He's had lots of leadership positions, uh, particularly in uh, SAGES as well as ASE. Um, and in 2020, became a founding member and part of the board of directors for the Society of Surgical Ergonomics. So Dr. Wright, thank you for being here this morning and really talking to us about something that is critical for us all for our daily practice and health. Dr. Wright. Great. Thank you all. And, and thanks for, for those of you on Zoom. Um, I appreciate everybody coming in this morning. So a couple disclosures, I do have some personal financial disclosures, uh, mostly working for Medtronic, that won't affect the content of this talk. Um, but as uh, Dr. Markhart mentioned, I am on the board of the Society of Surgical Ergonomics. And as you can see by the logo in the bottom corner of the slides, that is a certainly conflict of interest. So I do have a, a vested interest in promoting both the society and the whole concept of surgical ergonomics. Uh, the SSE has gotten some uh, funding from Intuitive, Molly, and Medtronic. Um, I will be discussing robotics, but I, I try not to be uh, uh, biased towards any particular company. Um, so my personal perspective on this comes from a number of uh, my own uh, incidents in my own life. Uh, a good friend of mine uh, says that all research is, is me-search, and certainly my work in surgical ergonomics comes from my own struggles. Uh, the picture uh, here on screen left, uh, that's actually me. Uh, this is the only picture I have uh, when I was going through chemo and went bald. Uh, the picture in the middle is again me, a selfie, uh, when I had not one but two arm braces on for repetitive stress injury from operating too much. And the picture on the right is my foot uh, with a uh, MRI when I had a soccer-related injury. Um, I'll come back to each of those things in turn. Um, we all like to think of ourselves as surgeons, as a skilled professional. We go to school for years, we train for years, we are highly intelligent people. We have to learn a lot, uh, technical skills. Um, uh, so we really think of ourselves as a profession. Uh, after my foot injury, I decided to think of myself as an athlete. And that's because my uh, sports medicine doc said he would treat me like a high performance athlete. And the concept is that we really need to be at peak physical performance in order to do our jobs. If you can't stand, if you can't walk, if you can't uh, st uh, operate the machinery, you can't do your job. So we are high performance athletes. But in reality, uh, we're manual laborers. And uh, we look and work in a medical industrial complex. And we are used by the institution writ large. Uh, and our bodies are on the line. So we are manual uh, laborers. We do physically arduous work with long periods of ergonomic strain. In a harsh environment, we are trained to pay attention to the patient and not to ourselves. This is a setup for injury. And in fact, surgeons have a, a equivalent injury rate uh, to factory workers. So we are manual laborers. If you look at any textbook for occupational health, uh, you can see risk factors for workplace injuries, things like manual handling and forceful exertions, uh, awkward positionings. And uh, when you go through this list, uh, this again, this is not surgery specific, you could argue that surgeons have almost all of them. Uh, high, even things like levels of ambient noise and temperatures in the operating room. And in some circumstances, I could even argue things like work from heights. I know at least two uh, OR workers that have fallen off of steps and been injured. Uh, and if you think about some of our orthopedic colleagues and some of their uh, power tools, you'd even get the vibration. We are, however, a unique environment. We are not factory workers. If you're on a factory line, every widget that comes down the factory line is the same. And so you can make changes to that environment to prevent injury. 
uh, we are beholden to our patients and our patients are an organic workspace and they're all a uh, variable. So variable weight and height and size and that affects our positioning and our ability to accommodate. It's also very time sensitive work. So it makes it harder to do things like, oh, I'm gonna take a break every 20 minutes. Again, we'll come back to that concept. So all of that has really led to what I call a hidden epidemic. And the reason I say it's a hidden epidemic is it's not really something we talk about very much. Uh, we may talk about it with our friends, but as a society, at the American College of Surgeons, at SAGES, at Society for Vascular Surgery, we don't really talk about these things. And we don't really go to, we all suffer in silence and individually, instead of going to the institution and saying, hey, we need to make some changes to protect ourselves. So what is the scope of the pain? Are we having an issue? Oh. All right, well, not, not something I could fix. Um, so what's the scope of the problem? Well, uh, about uh, three quarters, two thirds, depending on the study of surgeons uh, are typically in pain from operating. Uh, that's pain, fatigue, numbness, stiffness. Um, another survey in, in Europe, uh, about 90% of surgeons have pain in any given week, and about a third of surgeons are currently in pain. When you look at where that uh, occurs, what parts of the body, it's primarily spine, so cervical and lumbar spine, back pain, uh, but then a large uh, proportion of folks uh, like me with tendinitis and carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, fatigue, and even things like peripheral neuropathy. And, and getting back to my chemo story, I actually have peripheral neuropathy in my feet, which affects my ability to stand for long times. So all of these are physical needs of the body that we don't think about and don't accommodate. Our surgical culture is one of service and sacrifice and duty to our patients. Uh, we don't complain. We always take one for the team. We show up when we're sick and we struggle through. Uh, that culture is slowly changing. One of the perhaps benefits of COVID is it taught us that we actually are supposed to stay home when we're sick, uh, but we should also stay home when, when we're physically hurting as well and we need to recover. So, um, if so many of us are in pain at any given time or in any given week, how does that affect more than just the self? How does that affect the system writ large? Well, about 40% of surgeons have actually missed work due to a workplace injury. Uh, about a third will perform fewer operations, about 15 or 16% will actually think about leaving the profession. So if you think about the time and years and money invested in uh, training, and in onboarding and growing the practice of a junior surgeon, if you lose them to an injury, that's a huge financial hit to the institution. About half of surgeons feel that work-related physical discomfort will affect their ability to perform surgery in the future. And I'll admit I'm one of those 50%. I have actually changed my practice because of concerns over my ability to continue doing what I'm doing. That all leads actually to a moral injury and a moral injury um, is defined as, as really when you're in a moral bind. You have two competing needs. You have your need to the patient and to the system, and then you have the need to, to yourself and your family. And that puts you at risk for burnout, uh, higher rates of depersonalization and callousness. Uh, I just love the title. This is a, uh, the president of the SSE in one of her talks, and when doing what we love hurts us. So I just think that's a profound way to think about our profession. But again, it's not just about ourselves and our own needs because anything that impairs your ability to do your job affects our ability to care for our patients and for our loved ones. So this is not just about ourselves. If you think about our duty to our patients, our duty to our patients includes taking care of ourselves. It has a lot of ramifications that go on, again beyond the individual, even things like surgeon stress and effects on communication and teamwork. If your back's hurting, it's hard to stand there and uh, take an extra 20 minutes to teach your resident. If, you're, uh, if your hand or your arm is cramping up, are you gonna be less precise in your sutures? Uh, it affects your, your personal career longevity, your own finances, and it affects the finances of the institution. Uh, we've talked about some of the rates or reasons for the high rates of work-related musculoskeletal injury in surgeons. We talked about, we'll talk a little bit more about the principles of ergonomics, and we're gonna kind of step through a number of these, these issues. Uh, the first really is about our working conditions and our terrible posture. Uh, this is a picture of one of our, uh, Dr. Uh, Marcelli Nahosa, who's a, a friend and colleague, one of our former faculty. And you can see how he's hunched over the patient. 
the load that that puts on your cervical spine, the twist that it puts on your back, uh, all of the foot pedals and monitor placements and table heights and operating on obese patients, all of that leads to an effect. Uh, here you can see the, the spine and uh, back superimposed on this picture of surgeons operating. You can see the kind of axial loads that that's going to put on you. Anytime you use a surgical adjunct like loops or headlights, it actually is going to make things worse. So typical loops with a typical angle of declination forces you to lean your head forward. And uh, if you wear lead, a lead apron, just a 15 pound apron, uh, adds uh, 300 pounds of PSI on your discs. Uh, as a laparoscopic surgeon, laparoscopy is an independent risk factor for, uh, for pain and for injury. Uh, it's uh, put you in awkward positions in the service of your patient. And I've heard it said that laparoscopy is a means by which we transfer the pain of the patient onto the surgeon. And I think that's true also of things like endovascular surgery and other things that we do to try to minimize the pain and aid the recovery. We're taking that load on ourselves. We also take long, do long operations without a break. If you think about it, everybody else in the operating room gets a break. The anesthesiologist gets a break, the scrub tech gets a break, the nursing staff gets a break, we don't get a break. Um, the longer an operation goes, the more pain people have. So uh, if you look at the numbers, you know, if you have a two hour case, right? Pretty typical short case by my standards, um, you know, about 40% of people have pain. But if you've got a four hour case, you're up to two thirds. And if you've got an eight, 10 hour operation, you're really pushing the limits of what the human body can handle. It's not just the operating room. We have an increased digitization of what we do compared to back in the old days. Um, so if you're hunched over your computer, if you're hunched over your phone, if you're walking down the hallway answering a secure chat message, all of that's contributing to, to issues. Uh, and if you notice the chairs in our clinic are not exactly ergonomically aligned, comfortable chairs, uh, the chair in my clinic sinks by about an inch every 10 minutes because the hydraulics are broken. So it's, uh, it's a pretty typical situation in the hospital. There's not a lot of attention paid. I will say in my office, I do have a nice Herman Miller era, but that's uh, uh, because I'm a, a, a nerd about this kind of stuff. Uh, our tool design uh, is really made for sterilization and reproducibility and uniformity. Uh, so in the operating room, we have about 160 different manual instruments. This isn't even counting things like laparoscopy. This is just scissors, forceps, different varieties of scalpel handles. Um, but they're 